Section One of Emily Dickinson on Death. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Libby Gone. Emily Dickinson on Death by Emily Dickinson. Amherst, January second, eighteen fifty one to mrs strong tuesday evening i write a to-night because it is too cool and quiet and i can forget the toil and care of the feverish day and then i am selfish too because i am feeling lonely some of my friends are gone and some of my friends are sleeping sleeping the churchyard sleep the hour of evening is sad it was once my study hour my master has gone to rest, and the open leaf of the book and the scholar at school alone make the tears come, and I cannot brush them away. I would not if I could, for they are the only tribute I can pay the departed Humphrey. You have stood by the grave before. I have walked there sweet summer evenings and read the names on the stones and wondered who would come and give me the same memorial but I have never laid my friends there, and forgot that they too must die. This is my first affliction, and is too hard to bear it. To those bereaved so often that home is no more here, and whose communion with friends is had only in prayers, there must be much to hope for. But when the unreconciled spirit has nothing left but God, the spirit is lone indeed. I don't think there will be any sunshine or any singing birds in the spring that's coming. I will try not to say any more. My rebellious thoughts are many, and the friend I love and trust in has much now to forgive. I wish I were somebody else. I would pray the prayer of the Pharisee, but I am a poor little publican, son of David. Look down on me. "'Twas a great while ago when you wrote me. I remember the leaves were falling, and now there are falling snows. Who maketh the two to differ? Are not leaves the brethren of snows? Then it can't be a great while since then, though I verily thought it was. We are not so young as we once were, and time seems to be growing long. I dream of being a grand dame, and banding my silver hairs, and I seem to be quite submissive to the thought of growing old. No doubt you ride rocking horses in your present as in your young sleeps. Quite a pretty contrast, indeed, for me braiding my own grey hairs, and my friend at play with her childhood, a pair of decayed old ladies. Where are you, my antique friend, or my very dear and young one, just as you please to please? It may seem quite a presumption that I address you at all, knowing not if you have it here or if my bird has flown, in which world her wing is folded. When I think of the friends I love, and the little while we may dwell here, and then we go away, I have a yearning feeling, a desire eager and anxious, lest any be stolen away so that I cannot behold them. I would have you here, all here, where I can see you and hear you, and where I can say, oh no, if the Son of Man ever cometh. It is not enough now and then, at long and uncertain intervals, to hear you are alive and well. I do not care for the body. I love the timid soul, the blushing, shrinking soul. It hides, for it is afraid, and the bold, obtrusive body. Pray, Marm, did you call me? We are very small, eh? I think we grow still smaller, this tiny insect life the portal to another it seems strange strange indeed i am afraid we are all unworthy yet we shall enter in i can think of no other way than for you my dear girl to come here we are growing away from each other and talk even now like strangers to forget the meum and teum dearest friends must meet sometimes and then comes the bond of spirit, which, if I am correct, is unity. You are growing wiser than I am, and nipping in the bud fancies which I let blossom, 
perchance to bear no fruit, or if plucked I may find it bitter. The shore is safe for A, but I love to buffet the sea. I can count the bitter wrecks here in these pleasant waters, and hear the murmuring winds, but oh, I love the danger. You are learning control and firmness. Christ Jesus will love you more. I'm afraid he don't love me any. Write when you will, my friends, and forget all amiss herein. For as these few imperfect words to the full communion of spirits, so this small giddy life to the better, the eternal life, and that we may live this life and be filled with this true communion, I shall not cease to pray. E. End of section one. Section two of Emily Dickinson on Death by Emily Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Libby Gone. Autumn, 1876, to Dr. and Mrs. Holland. Saturday Eve. Dear Hollands, good night. I can't stay any longer in a world of death. Austin is ill of the fever. I buried my garden last week. Our man, Dick, lost a little girl through the scarlet fever. I thought, perhaps, that you were dead, and not knowing the sexton's address, interrogate the daisies. Ah, dainty, dainty death! Ah, democratic death! Grasping the proudest zinnia from my purple garden, then deep to his bosom calling the serf's child. Say, is he everywhere? Where shall I hide my things? Who is alive? The woods are dead. Is Mrs. H. alive? Annie and Katie, they are below, or received to nowhere. I shall not tell how short time is, for I was told by lips which sealed as soon as it was said, and the open revere the shut. You were not here in summer. Summer. My memory flutters. Had I... was there a summer... You should have seen the fields go, gay little entomology, swift little ornithology, dancer and floor and cadence quite gathered away, and I, a phantom, to you a phantom, rehearse the story. An orator of feather unto an audience of fuzz, and pantomimic plaudits, quite as good as a play, indeed. Tell Mrs. Holland she is mine and ask her if vice versa mine is but just the thief's request remember me to-day such are the bright chirographies of the lamb's book good night my ships are in my window overlooks the wharf one yacht and a man of war two brigs and a schooner down with a topmast lay her a hold a hold emily End of section two. Section three of Emily Dickinson on Death by Emily Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Libby Gone. Let down the bars, O death. The tired flocks come in, whose bleating ceases to repeat, whose wandering is done. Thine is the stillest night, thine the securest fold. Too near thou art for seeking thee, too tender to be told. End of section three. Section four of Emily Dickinson on Death by Emily Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Libby Gone Going to heaven, I don't know when, pray do not ask me how, indeed I'm too astonished to think of answering you. Going to heaven, how dim it sounds, and yet it will be done as sure as flocks go home at night unto the shepherd's arm. Perhaps you're going too, who knows? If you should get there first, save just a little place for me close to the two I lost. The smallest robe will fit me, and just a bit of crown, 
for you know we do not mind our dress when we are going home. I'm glad I don't believe it, for it would stop my breath, and I'd like to look a little more at such a curious earth. I am glad they did believe it, whom I have never found since the mighty autumn afternoon I left them in the ground. End of section four. Section five of Emily Dickinson on Death by Emily Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Libby Gone. Morns like this we parted. Noons like these she rose, fluttering first, then firmer to her fair repose. Never did she lisp it, and twas not for me. She was mute from transport, and I from agony. Till the evening nearing, one the shutters drew, quick, a sharper rustling, and this linnet flew. End of section five. Section six of Emily Dickinson on Death by Emily Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Libby Gone. I read my sentence steadily, reviewed it with my eyes to see that I made no mistake in its extremest clause. The date and manner of the shame, and then the pious form, that God have mercy on the soul the jury voted him. I made my soul familiar with her extremity, that at the last it should not be a novel agony. But she and death, acquainted, meet tranquilly as friends, salute and pass without a hint, and there the matter ends. End of section six. Section seven of Emily Dickinson on Death. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Libby Gone. The only ghost I ever saw was dressed in Mechlin, so he wore no sandal on his foot, and stepped like flakes of snow. His gait was soundless like the bird, but rapid like the roe. His fashions quaint, mosaic, or haply mistletoe. His conversation seldom his laughter like the breeze that dies away in dimples among the pensive trees. Our interview was transient, of me himself was shy, and God forbid I look behind since that appalling day. End of section 7 Section 8 of Emily Dickinson on Death by Emily Dickinson this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Libby Gone. Memorials Death sets a thing significant the eye had hurried by, except a perished creature entreat us tenderly to ponder little workmanships in crayon or in wool, with this was the last her fingers did, industrious until the thimble weighed too heavy, the stitches stopped themselves and then twas put among the dust upon the closet shelves. The book I have a friend gave, whose pencil here and there had notched the place that pleased him, at rest his fingers are. Now when I read, I read not, for interrupting tears obliterate the etchings, too costly for repairs. End of section 8 Section 9 of Emily Dickinson on Death by Emily Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Libby Gone. The Journey Our journey had advanced. Our feet were almost come to that odd fork in being's road, eternity by term. Our place took sudden awe, our feet reluctant led. Before were cities, but between, the forest of the dead. Retreat was out of hope, behind a sealed route, eternity's white flag before, 
and God at every gate. End of section 9、section 10 of Emily Dickinson on Death by Emily Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Libby Gone. Going. On such a night, or such a night, would anybody care if such a little figure slipped quiet from its chair? So quiet, oh, how quiet, that nobody might know, but that the little figure rocked softer to and fro. On such a dawn, or such a dawn, would anybody sigh that such a little figure too sound asleep did lie for chanticleer to wake it, or stirring house below? or giddy bird in orchard or early task to do there was a little figure plump for every little knoll busy needles and spools of thread and trudging feet from school playmates and holidays and nuts and visions vast and small strange that the feet so precious charged should reach so small a goal end of section ten Section eleven of Emily Dickinson on Death by Emily Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Libby Gone. If I should die, and you should live, and time should gurgle on, and morn should beam, and noon should burn, as it has usual done, if birds should build as early, and bees as bustling go, one might depart at option from enterprise below. Tis sweet to know that stocks will stand when we with daisies lie, that commerce will continue, and trades as briskly fly. It makes the parting tranquil, and keeps the soul serene, that gentlemen so sprightly conduct the pleasing scene. End of section 11 Section twelve of Emily Dickinson on Death by Emily Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Libby Gone. Ghosts. One need not be a chamber to be haunted, one need not be a house. The brain has corridors surpassing material place, far safer of a midnight meeting external ghost than an interior confronting that whiter host. Far safer through an abbey gallop, the stones a chase, than moonless one's own self encounter in the lonesome place. Our self behind our self concealed should startle most, assassin hid in our apartment be horrors least. The prudent carries a revolver, he bolts the door, or looking a superior spectre more near. End of section twelve. Section thirteen of Emily Dickinson on Death by Emily Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Libby Gone. What inn is this where for the night peculiar traveller comes? Who is the landlord? Where the maids? Behold, what curious rooms! No ruddy fires on the hearth, no brimming tankards flow necromancer landlord who are these below end of section 13 section 14 of emily dickinson on death by emily dickinson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by libby gone till the end I should not dare to leave my friend, because if he should die while I was gone, and I too late should reach the heart that wanted me, if I should disappoint the eyes that hunted, hunted so to see, and could not bear to shut until they noticed me, they noticed me, if I should stab the patient faith so sure I'd come, so sure I'd come, it listening, listening went to sleep, telling my tardy name, 
my heart would wish it broke before since breaking then since breaking then were useless as next morning's sun where midnight frosts had lain End of section fourteen Section fifteen of Emily Dickinson on Death by Emily Dickinson this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Libby Gone. The Chariot. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves and immortality. We slowly drove, he knew no haste, and I had put away my labor and my leisure too for his civility. We passed the school where children played, their lessons scarcely done. We passed the fields of gazing grain, we passed the setting sun. We paused before a house that seemed a swelling of the ground. The roof was scarcely visible, the commis but a mound. Since then tis centuries, but each feels shorter than the day I first surmised the horses' heads were towards eternity. End of section 15 Section 16 of Emily Dickinson on Death by Emily Dickinson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Libby Gone Death is a dialogue between the spirit and the dust. Dissolve, says death, the spirit, sir, I have another trust death doubts it argues from the ground the spirit turns away just laying off for evidence an overcoat of clay end of section 16 section 17 of emily dickinson on death by emily dickinson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by libby gone at length her final summer was it, and yet we guessed it not. If tenderer industriousness pervaded her, we thought, a further force of life developed from within, when death lit all the shortness up and made the hurry plain. We wondered at our blindness when nothing was to see but her Carrara guidepost at our stupidity. When, duller than our dullness, the busy darling lay, so busy was she finishing, so leisurely were we. End of section 17 Section 18 of Emily Dickinson on Death by Emily Dickinson This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Libby Gone Newman Lumen I live with him, I see his face, I go no more away, for visitor or sundown. Death's single privacy, the only one for stalling mine, and by that right that he presents a claim invisible, no wedlock granted me. I live with him, I hear his voice, I stand alive to-day to witness the certainty of immortality, taught me by time the lower way conviction every day the life like this is endless be judgment what it may end of section eighteen section nineteen of emily dickinson on death by emily dickinson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by libby gone I meant to find her when I came. Death had the same design, but the success was his, it seems, and the discomfort mine. I meant to tell her how I longed for just this single time, but death told her so the first, and she had hearkened him. To wander now is my abode. To rest would be a privilege of hurricane to memory and me. End of section 19 
Section twenty of Emily Dickinson on Death by Emily Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Libby Gone. If I may have it when it's dead, I will contented be. If just so soon as breath is out, it shall belong to me. Until they lock it in the grave, tis bliss I cannot weigh. For though they lock thee in the grave, myself can hold the key. Think of it, lover, I and thee, permitted face to face to be. After a life, a death will say, for death was that, and this is thee. End of section twenty. Section twenty one of Emily Dickinson on Death by Emily Dickinson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Libby Gone. There's been a death in the opposite house as lately as today. I know it by the numb look such houses have alway. The neighbors rustle in and out, the doctor drives away. A window opens like a pod, abrupt, mechanically. Somebody flings a mattress out, the children hurry by. They wonder if it died on that. I used to when a boy. The minister goes stiffly in, as if the house were his, and he owned all the mourners now, and little boys besides. And then the milliner, and the man of the apparelling trade, to take the measure of the house. There'll be that dark parade of tassels and of coaches soon. It's easy as a sign. The institution of the news is just a country town. End of section 21section twenty two of emily dickinson on death by emily dickinson this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by libby gone after great pain a formal feeling comes the nerves sit ceremonious like tombs the stiff heart questions was it he that bore and yesterday or centuries before the feet mechanical go round a wooden way of ground or air or aught regardless grown a quartz contentment like a stone this is the hour of lead remembered if outlived as freezing persons recollect the snow first chill then stupor then the letting go End of section twenty two End of Emily Dickinson on Death by Emily Dickinson